I want to talk to you today about transitions, and not just because of Pastor Lupe transitioning, although it fit really well. I know this isn't your catered Mother's Day sermon, and happy Mother's Day. I love all of you. You guys are amazing. But we're going to talk about transitions today. And, um, you know, transition is in the air right now. Some, God, God is doing something. Um, he's calling some away. He's calling some to. He is working on your life, okay, the processes of your life. He's uh, walking you through steps of healing and steps to be healthy and whole within your own heart. And uh, transition right now is just in the air. And I want to encourage you to pay attention to what God is doing because he's loudly speaking right now. He's speaking to each and every single one in the body of Christ. I can literally go talk to somebody who doesn't know me and talk to them at another church, maybe another pastor, and we will say the same things. The reason why, it's because God is having a conversation right now with his church. He's, he's talking to his church, the body of Christ. And I believe that God is positioning and aligning his church to be the advancing church rather than the, the scale back away church. You know, to, to be the church that, that he's looking for when he comes back. Guys, we're about ready to see a major shift happen um, in the next year or two. And I'm not talking about politically. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. If you guys have noticed lately, the supernatural stuff of heaven, right, is ramping up. Okay? But not only in the good way, but also in the bad way because demonic spirits are beginning to speak just as much as well. And so it's really important that we learn to discern between the two things because the enemy comes as an angel of light claiming to be God, wanting to speak to you, but really it's not him. That's why the Bible says, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. That's a good word. I'm going to read to you a prophetic word from Sean Bolt. Sean Bolt is a, is a modern-day prophet in today's culture. He's been around for a long, long, long time. And when I say prophet, you know, some people have a hard time with the five-fold gifts of the church because, you know, we don't want to say, well, he's a prophet or he's an apostle. Look, let's just get over this already. God gave the gifts of the church to bring maturity and health to the church. Okay. And so there are such people called prophets in the kingdom of God. Now, the way maybe you grew up, prophet, is that you would have a felt board and they would begin to talk to you about the end times, okay? Really, what prophets do is they come and they, they the, the best way that I can explain it is that they hear from the Lord like a FedEx package, okay? And the FedEx package comes to their hands and then they're the deliverer of the FedEx package. That's called the word. Okay, so they drop it at your doorstep. Now, you can choose to grab the FedEx package from your porch, okay, or from your front doorstep, or you can leave it there. You can open it up however you want to do it, okay? They are responsible for what God has to speak and what God says, only to further and advance the kingdom of God in the life of a believer, Amen. all right? So Sean Boltz, modern-day prophet, March 8, 2023, said this. There is a huge change of influence in Christianity coming through transition that is taking place right now. The season of one of the greatest transitions is upon us. There is a divine setup right now, and you, and you see if this fits your, your life right now, okay? And you may be experiencing the pain of transition because you aren't understanding how much is about to change in your life. Maybe your job is no longer a passion place. Maybe you are moving. Maybe God is bringing you through a process that you wouldn't have chosen yourself, but you are in the middle of obedience without the fruit of it yet. He says, keep going, keep trusting. Globally, God is setting his people in place to checkmate the enemy in industries, regions, positions, and influence. He has given you promises and destiny over your life, and he is about to activate them. That's Sean Bolts' word. This, can anybody resonate with that maybe just a little bit? Where God is shifting, he's changing, he's moving things in your life. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's stuff at your home. Uh, maybe God has laid on your heart lately to move from your current place of, uh, of your home, to move to another home maybe down the road somewhere, and you're just like, why am I feeling this way? <laughs> or, or whatever the case is. Pay attention to the things that are just out in the open because God, that's how God speaks a lot of times. When we least expect him, you're walking in the desert and bang, there's a fiery bush. 
right? Moses very could have clearly walked away from that and says, well, that's weird, and then walked away from it. But no, he paid attention. Why? Because there was holiness in the room, right? There was holiness on that ground. And so I want to encourage you today to tune your ears to God, tune your ears to him. You can listen to me all day. Please don't just rely on me to feed you, okay? Listen for God yourself. Go to him. Go to the word of God, all right? And, 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 and another thing, too, your Bible says this. Your Bible says this. Oh, you tell me if your Bible says this. The way a person grows and matures is to go to another Bible study. It, 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 that, those are good things to do, okay? But no, the Bible says this. Your word says this. My food is to do the will of my Father. That's what your word says. And so if you're feeling like you're a little empty and maybe, maybe someone's not feeding you quite correctly or, or you're here and you're going, oh, well, you know, I'm just not. Look, do the will of God rather than just waiting for someone to feed you the will of God. Do the things you're supposed to do. There's already things on your doorstep right now that God has laid on your heart to do, and you haven't yet done them yet. And so that's the reason why that we may feel empty in our hearts. It's because we haven't stepped out in faith and actually seen growth happen in our life. Growth doesn't happen by what you know necessarily, but it happens when you apply the things that you know, and you get to live by faith and activate that in your heart. That's how that works. That's how that works. So when we talk about transition and movement, there's one truth about God that we have to remember, that he's never changing. Amen? He's never changing, but he's always moving. His nature, how he does, who he is, never changes. How he does things, always does. Who he is, never changes. How he does it, always does. Because he's always moving. It's not in his nature to simply stay in one place. That's why there's verses like this. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, give you hope in the future. You guys track it with me, the verses? Uh -huh. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. <laughs> That's why these verses are in your word is because he's implying to us and getting us ready to actually live by faith. And not just by the word only, but to go out and actually trust him when things are, are, they don't line up, they don't make sense. But when he speaks, it's our responsibility to fulfill the word of the Lord over our lives. Change and transition is inevitable when it comes to the kingdom of God. And as believers in Christ, we have to grow comfortable with change. We have to grow comfortable with transition. We have to grow comfortable with movement. Just by a show of hands real quick, how many of you guys are uncomfortable with change? You don't like things to change. I bet if I went into your house, that coffee pot would be in the same place it's been for 20 years. <laughs> we just don't move it, <laughs> you know, because if we do, I don't know how I'm going to drink coffee because there's no coffee there, Right? Just as natural human beings, we are typically not fond of change. We're not fond of transition. We're not, it's not our greatest desire to, to be going in a direction and grow comfortable and, and grow confident in what we're doing. And then all of a sudden, we got to switch gears. Just by natural things, we're not, we're, not, we're not used to, we don't like change. Me, on the other hand, let's change, baby. I'm cool with anything, <laughs> right? I'm not talking about everything. I love the process. I love the, I love the sustainability of doing things all the time in the routine of things. But I want to be able to say at the end of my life that I follow Jesus no matter what it looked like. Yeah. I want to be able to say to heaven that no matter what it took, even if it meant changing my my, my ideas, even if it meant changing my agenda, even if it meant changing the way we do things, so that way God can be honored rather than me be honored to people. Because if God's not honored through my life, then I've already got my reward. Yep, that's right. We're killing it this morning, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good word. 
<laughs> Not everything should stay the same, nor should it stay the same. My belief is, is if we're not changing, we're not growing. And if we're not growing, we're getting stagnant. And if we're stagnant, then Jesus calls us fruitless. And if we're fruitless, then we are dead. Think about the fruit in your life. <laughs> I just thought of something, and I'm not going to. Well, maybe I will say it. I so want to. It's right here. I'm going to do it, baby. I love you. I'm not talking about the fruit of your loins. That was unnecessary. I'm talking about the fruit of which you live your life. The things that follow you, when you look back on your life and you look back at your history and you look back even a week ago, what are things that are following you? That's the fruit that we leave. That's the fruit that's growing in our lives. That's maturing in our hearts. It's maturing in our lives. And if we're fruitless, the last time I read in your Bible, Jesus walked up to the fruitless tree and cursed it dead. I'm going to read that quote to you again that I wrote. If we're not changing, we're not growing. And if we're not growing, we're getting stagnant. And if we're stagnant, then Jesus calls us fruitless. And if we're fruitless, we are dead. We are dead. Transition and change helps us create and leave a legacy for the generations that will come behind us. That's what transition and change does. Too many times us believers get caught up in our own little world where we just focus right in on what we're doing, right here, right in the middle, only the thing that we can see right in front of us. And some people actually live their lives that way, and I'm not dogging that. I think that's a great way to live your life, be present in the moment. But there's certain things that we have to understand that when we look past our lives, what's coming behind us? It's not necessarily about what we're doing right now in front of us, but what we do right now is going to leave a legacy so the generations behind us can follow. So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of church do we want to have after we're done, after we're gone away, after we leave this earth? And we're up in heaven. When we look down, I know this is just a simple uh, illustration, okay? I don't think this really happens. But when we look down from heaven, right, and we see River of Life Church, what kind of church is it going to be? And we don't start then. We actually start now. So let me just suggest to you this morning that maybe there's some things in your life, in your personal life, that need to change in order to see the next generation coming behind us join in with what we're doing right now. What do you want? I believe that there's a blueprint in the Bible on how to deal with change, how to deal with transition, and how to process these things in our lives. Number one, the number one blueprint, if you will, is to don't be anxious for anything. Turning your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Say, uh huh, when you're there. Mm hmm. Oop, that's Revelation. Went too far. Ephesians. Uh -huh. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's like the woo girl. Woo. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, it says this. I'm reading out of the ESV version, and it says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, be, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let me read that again. Don't be anxious about anything. What, what does that say again? Don't be anxious about anything. Isn't it interesting that that's the thing we combat the most is anxiety? Whenever we're making a decision, whenever we feel like God is transitioning us, whenever we feel a change coming upon our lives, whenever we're working through a process in our own hearts, we actually become more anxious because we actually like the way that we're living. And we actually like what we're doing. But when God comes, it's like, oh my gosh, we start thinking about all the things that 
aren't really reality. They're real here, but they're not actually reality because they haven't happened yet. So we come up with these ideas and these thoughts of things that may not happen, right? But that's what causes anxiety in our lives. <laughs> so the word of God is actually speaking to us. And I want you to know that this is for me more than anybody else. Don't be anxious about anything. How clear can it be? Now, I know that the battle is harder than what we're just talking about right here. I understand that. And I know that because that's the battlefield of the mind. But anxiety really comes down to how much do we really trust the Lord and what he speaks to us. See, when we get into a car with our mom, since it's Mother's Day, right, and they're like, do you want to to, uh, you go to this store? What's the first thoughts that we think? Well, which store are we going to? We want to know all the details before we actually get in the car. And that's how it is in our own personal life. We want to know all the things that are going to happen before we actually commit. See, God doesn't really work that way. He says, commit first, then understanding will happen. That's how that works. Faith first, understanding later. That's why it's important to lead by faith, to lead by confidence, and to lead by peace. Peace really just means confidence. So let me say it one more time. Peace is one of my strongest weapons in prayer. Let's say it together. Peace is one of my strongest weapons in prayer. It's so true. Because when we actually are confident in what Christ is doing, really not knowing the outcome of what's going to happen, right, then what we're doing is we're saying, God, I trust you. I believe you. I know that you're with me. I know that you're for me. And you will never let anything go wrong in my life that I can't handle. Because you've called me. So don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, that's key, With thanksgiving, being thankful creates an atmosphere of miracles to happen in your life. When you're thankful, that's why we're fasting negativity and finding things to be joyful about. Because when we're thankful, it creates an atmosphere in your home for miracles to take place. God is not attracted to your anxiety. God is not attracted to our our, uh, lack of trust. God is not attracted to our negativity. But he is attracted to trust. He's attracted to love. He's attracted to mercy. He's attracted to the people of God who actually say it is all about you and not about me. More of you, less of me. So why does the Bible tell us about don't be anxious for anything? Because prayers of anxiety are not prayers of authority. Let me say that again. Prayers of anxiety are not prayers of authority. When in transition, remember who you are, and even more, remember whose you are. In transition. So let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to keep praise as the central part of your life during your transition. Keep worship. Praise, keep Jesus the man central to your life. All the things will still be there. All the things that we're supposed to worry about are all still going to be there. Those aren't going to change. They're all going to come your way. But if we can just keep Jesus and keep, him, and keep focused on him and remember him and worship him and magnify him and glorify him and give him the highest praise, Right during this, it will cause the anxiety level to go down in our life and our confidence level to go up in our life. But we got to focus in on Jesus. Keeping your eyes on Jesus will help you discern what the will of God is for your life. And automatically thinking, listen to this, automatically thinking everything that happens is God's will is a lazy way to live. Let me read that again. Automatically thinking, everything that happens, it just happens. That's God's will. No, that's a lazy way to live. You and I, we live in a war. Jesus wasn't fighting the Father's will when he raised the dead. So keep focused on Jesus, and when he is central to all you do in your life, you'll never lose focus on the mission in hand. Because the mission isn't the transition, the mission is Jesus. When you're moving homes, getting a promotion, moving destinations, keep Jesus central 
And the best way to keep him central is to worship him. Is to worship him. Keep your eyes on the man. Let me say that again. Keep your eyes on the man. And if you're married here today, I'm not talking about your man. Although I'm sure he'd like that. But keep your eyes on the man. On Jesus. The second blueprint, I believe, is walking on the word. It's walking on the word. There's a great story in the Bible about Peter walking on water. You guys know what story I'm talking about? I have to ask those questions because we live in a generation who doesn't know the Bible. Okay? So Peter, they're on a boat. I'm on a boat. They're on a boat. And they were, (laughs) they were, uh, they're in this middle of the storm. Jesus is, you know, doing something else. And, uh, and they thought they're all going to die because the storm was overcoming their, their, uh, their, their place of assurance. Okay. And so it's going here, here. They're getting slapped by the wave, the wind. It's gonna, they're going to sink. Then they see somebody coming on the water. It's Jesus. Jesus is literally walking on the water. This isn't metaphorical. This isn't something that is just a great story. This literally happened. Jesus walked on the water. And they got so freaked out, they're like, oh, my gosh, a ghost on the water. (laughs) Which is a weird thing to think, right, if you think about it. Right, what a weird thing to think where they go, oh, no, a ghost. Right? But then they get a little clearer picture and they see that it's Jesus. And not to exaggerate the story, Peter says, if it's you, God, bid me to come, and I'll get out of this boat, and I'll walk on the water to you. Uh Right? And then what does Jesus say? Jesus says, come. Come. Peter gets out of the boat, steps on the water, waves and everything, walks on the same water as Jesus is walking on. Isn't it interesting that Peter was walking in the same turbulence as Jesus was walking on? He didn't calm the seas and then walk on it. No, he calmed, he he walked on the water when the waves were whipping around. The same water, the same wind, the same waves that were going to sink the boat when they were afraid, Peter now is walking on that same water that Jesus was walking on. But here's the cool thing. You see, Jesus didn't, or I'm sorry, Peter didn't just walk on the water. He walked on the word. And the word was come. The word was come. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. He didn't say come to your transition. He didn't say come to this. He didn't say come to that. No, he said come to me. Jesus is always drawing himself, drawing you to himself. Always. He's always drawing you to himself. Because he knows that he has you, nothing else around you is going to matter. Nothing else around you. It could be the worst turbulent time in your life. But if you just simply walk on the word, if you walk on the word, see, Jesus will always stretch your faith into something you can't do in your natural. Because if we can do it in our natural, why do we need God? He asks you to do things that are supernatural. Because through him, all things are possible. When you're willing to do what you're qualified to do, when you're willing to do what you're unqualified to do, that's what qualifies you. Let me say that again. When you're willing to do what you're unqualified to do, that's what qualifies you. When you're willing to take a step on the word, when you don't feel like it's something you can do, that you're not fully equipped to do, when you're willing to do that, God says, I mark you now. You will be successful. You will move forward in my kingdom. And if none of that happens, at least you're going to learn about what it's like to follow me. To deny yourself, to pick up my cross and follow. 
So many people want to hear God so clearly before they ever make a move. Before they ever transition, they want to hear God. They want to have the blueprint. They want to have the walkway. They want to have exactly what's going to happen. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't work that way a lot of the times. Yes, sometimes he gives you specific clarity with clear instructions and direction. But sometimes he doesn't work that way. A lot of the times what he wants you to do is remember who you're with. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Until the end of the world. It's not about what you're doing. It's about who you're with and who's with you. Remember, you're smart enough. You are brave enough. You are courageous enough to step in faith. Amen. That's who you are. Amen. The third blueprint is understand that trust goes both ways. And, Jane, if you could play just a little soft music in the back there. Understand that trust goes both ways. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The rest of that verse says, in all your ways acknowledge him. Again, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Trust in God when you sense transition in your life is the easiest thing to say, but one of the most difficult things to do. The reason why trust is important, because what we're saying is, again, I'm in the car with you, God. You're in the driver's seat. I'm just along for the ride wherever you go. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. I'm your passenger. I'm not in control. I'm your passenger. And don't be a backseat driver to God. Stop that. It's kind of like a lot of people who want to aspire to be in ministry always tell the pastor how they should be doing things until it's their turn to do it. And then they go, no, thank you. No, thank you. I don't, I don't want to be in charge. No, that's... that's I just want to tell you how to be in charge. Really what that is, is just insecurity coming up from your life. And that's something that you need to be healed from. Now, just point that into any area of your life. I'm not necessarily talking about pastoral ministry. Trust me, I don't get that very much here. But not very much, because you guys are awesome. But think about that in your own personal life. You should be doing this, and you should be doing that, and you should be doing that. And God's saying, hey, look, you want to come in the driver's seat with me? You want to take a stab at this? No, 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 no. God, I just want to tell you how to do things. God, I just want to, I want to tell you how I want my life to be. God, I just want to tell you the things that I want to do. I'm not really interested in the, where you want to take me. I just want to do what I want to do. Eventually, God's going to say, well, if that's how you want to be, that's fine with me. Go ahead and exit the car door. Find your own car and you can drive. It's okay. I'll be here for you. The door will be wide open whenever you're ready to come back. Trust. We always want to know what's going to happen before we actually commit. transition, when we're transitioning in our lives and we have things that are going on in our lives, <laughs> we have to understand that when we're talking about transition here, we're not talking about your sexual identity. I felt like I had to say that. Because that's a lie from the pit of hell. It really is. But transition, when you're walking through life and you're processing through life and you're and you're going through it and you're and you're and you're and you're What's next? And you feel God getting ready to do something. You can always tell because you feel a little bit of pressure. You know, you just feel a little bit of pressure. 
And you have a choice here to either, God, is that you moving through me? Or is that you just wanting me to break through to the next place? There's that discernment we have to have in our hearts. That's why it's so important for us to hear God and to lean on Him. Right? But when we learn to transition from the identity of a son, of a child of God. Remember last week how we talked about being a child of God? When we learn to transition as a son, identify as a son, as we learn to transition as a child of God, that will lead us into our next place with confidence, peace, and power. Because you're not going to, you're not making this transition to gain identity, but you're going and you're making this transition because you have it already. Again, you know whose you are. You're walking in confidence that he has you, that you're with him. Psalms 91, you're under the wing of the Lord. Right? You see, royalty is my identity. Servanthood is my assignment. Intimacy with God is my life source. Let me say that again. Royalty is my identity. Servanthood is my assignment. Intimacy with God is my life source. So, before God, I am intimate. Before people, I am a servant. Before the powers of hell, I'm a ruler with no tolerance for their influence. That's who you are. That's what it means to be royalty. That's what it means to be a son. That's what it means to be a child of God. So wherever God leads you, wherever the season you might be in right now, whatever circumstance or trial you might be facing, you're in that. Not only do we trust him, but you're in that because he trusts you. Because he trusts you. I'll be starting my 15th year of my kidney transplant. Actually, this week. Is it? Tomorrow, May 15th? Yeah, that's when I got my, that's actually when I got my transplant almost 15 years ago. And I remember going through that process. And I remember going through those things, thinking to myself, God, don't you care about me? (laughs) Come on, man. Like, I want you to heal me. Have you guys ever asked that question before? Why aren't I getting healed? I'm sure my mom had the same questions. Why isn't my son getting healed? I'm sure my wife had the same questions. I'm sure things were just being stirred up. I was praying for people and watching them get touched by God and be healed. Saw a man with burns all over his legs get totally healed just like that with new skin. I thought, God, hey, over here. How about me, Lord? And God just continued to say, I trust you, Jake. I trust you. It's nice to know, but it'd be great if you healed me. But he trusts you. You want to know why he trusts me in those moments? Because like Job, he knew that I would never turn away from him. And he trusts you right now in the circumstance and the trial that you're going through and the things that you're, that's happening right now in your life, all because he knows that you're not going to turn your heart away from him. He knows that. Now, I wish I had a penny for every time I had to answer the question, well, why is this happening? I don't know. All I know is that I believe and trust God's sovereignty more than I believe in my own thinking. And I'm saying, God, it's not I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. I'm saying, God, whatever you have to do, I want you more than anything. I want you more than anything. And he trusts you. He trusts you with his word. He trusts you with his name. He believes in you. He believes in everything that you're about and what you're doing right now. He trusts you. And he's saying, go get him. He's saying, go into the world. Preach the gospel. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. Do everything that I've commanded you to do. Why? Because he says, I trust you with it. He's saying, I've given it to you. Freely I've received, so freely I give. Go and make disciples of all nations. 
Go and do the things that I've called you to do. Why? Because I trust you. Well, God, things aren't going right in my life. That's okay. I trust you. I'm going through this circumstance. It's okay. I trust you. I believe in you. The best thing we can do is if you're going through a situation right now, a trial, maybe you don't understand what's going on, is stop being so self-interested and self-introspective and begin to go and preach the gospel. Go and lay your hands on somebody who's sick and see what God does. Let's steal away from the enemy his rewards and let's bring him to Jesus and say, here, God, I yield my harvest to you. Amen? Amen. Why? Because royalty is my identity. Servanthood is my assignment. Intimacy with God is my life source. So before God and God alone, not before man, not before you, not before even myself, but before God, I'm intimate. Before people, I'm a servant. Before the powers of hell, I'm a ruler with no tolerance for their influence. No tolerance for their influence. It's less about what you do and more about who you are, and whose you are. Amen? Amen. Amen. So you may be going through a transition right now. You may be considering a job change. You may be considering moving where you're at in your house right now, maybe moving out to the country. That's what everyone's doing right now anyway. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to Florida, baby. <laughs> right? You may be considering something, something transitional in your life, or maybe God's just walking you through a process right now where he's leaning on you. He's got his spirit, and it's becoming a little bit pressurized because he's dealing with you in a certain place in your life, a certain area in your life that you've been reluctant to give and surrender to him. But God's saying, stop resisting. Take your heels out of the ground. I'm speaking to somebody right now. Take your heels out of the ground and give up. And give up. Give your life to him. Give that area of your life over to Jesus. Whatever that might be. So many, so many, and trust me, guys, I walk this out all the time with myself. So many of us. We get to this place where we go, everything's fine, don't worry about it, it's all good, I'm all right, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. And we shrug off the things that God is trying to work in our life by by saying everything's okay. And the reason why we say that is because we don't want to deal internally with the things that are going on. We want some kind of... Like, like for some of us, maybe we want some kind of notoriety or, or maybe some of us, we want some kind of image that we want people to look at. Look, do you want that or do you want what God says about us? Because if you want that, that will be your reward. Take it, that's your crown. But I want what God wants. I want what he wants. If I live by the praises of men, I will certainly die when I don't have them. I don't need the praises of men. Jesus, help me just to be in you. Amen? Amen. Let's bow and close your eyes. Father, you're a good God. We love you with all of our heart. Thank you for your presence and your spirit. Help us, Jesus, to grow in confidence in the things that you're doing in our lives, the transitions that are happening right now. You're in a pruning season right now, Father, and I believe that. It doesn't always feel good. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. But God, no matter what it is, Lord, we're going to trust you. We're going to walk with you. We're going to go with you. We're going to be with you, Jesus. Just by a show of hands here this morning, is there anybody here that says, I'm going through a transition in my life right now? Come on, just put it up. Great. Awesome. All over the place. Hallelujah. Yeah, you got this. You got this. You can put your hands down. That's fine. I don't want you to get tired. 
You got this. You got this. It's because God's with you. He's always for you. He's never against you. And he's with you to the very end of the age. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I just declare over every single person here, God, that's going through transition, that, Lord, you know exactly the steps. You know exactly the things that need to happen. And, God, so we commit our lives to you. We, we surrender and give up those areas of our life, Lord, that we need to give up. And, Lord, in return for you, Lord, we bless you in Jesus' name.